You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to welcome back one of my all-time favorite authors and one of my favorite people to get to chat with here on the show, uh, R.A. Salvatore, or as as we like to call him, Bob. Uh, Bob has a brand new book. It's called Starlight Enclave, and it's the first in a brand new trilogy called The Way of the Drow. And it's available everywhere today when you're hearing this. We're going to put uh, links to it in the show notes. Bob, th- what an incredible book. Every time a new book or, or especially a new series is released by you, um, you know, I, I wonder, is there anything new that we can learn uh, about Drizzt, uh, about the world, about this this whole fantasy experience that you've created for us over the last 30 years? And every time you you deliver, you up the ante again and again and again. Thank you so much for that, and uh, welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for that great intro. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, <clears throat> if there comes a point where there's nothing left to tell, I'll stop. It, it, it's really that simple. Um, this book I've been thinking about for four years. Because it became very evident to me that we needed to, I don't want to say change, change some things. I don't want to say that because people freak out if you say that word. But I guess we needed to spotlight different aspects of the drow. And and I did it with the last trilogy with Generations when I went back in time and I showed what was a lot of what was going on behind the scenes in, in Menzo Baranzan. And I think this is just a logical continuation of that journey. So it's it's really easy book from it was I want to say it's an easy book to write because that gives a that gives an impress an impression that creating something like this is easy and it's not. Um, but it was a, a book that I was really looking forward to writing for a long time. I love it. Um, and and there's many specifics about it that I want to chat about in a minute. But before we do. The last time we talked, you told me that uh, a a writer and a character that had a huge impression on you at a at a young age was Charlie Brown, and Absolutely. you talked about the the impact that Charles Schultz, uh, the the writer, the the artist of, of of Peanuts, had on you. Over this last year, um, with all that we've been through as a society and 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 personally with the the COVID pandemic. Was there any point where you kind of felt like Charlie Brown and and Lucy's pulling that football out from under you again? (laughs) I feel like that all the time. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And by the way, uh, I I just did a post the other day about how I've just just advising people, quit driving yourselves insane, you know, shut off cable news and talk radio and feeds that are feeding you anger. Yeah. On in social media and i think it's it's almost it's worse than lucy pulling the football out i almost get the feeling i was pulling the football out from in front of myself and that's kind of stupid if you think about it but um yeah absolutely i mean it's been it's been an incredibly we live in we live in interesting times and that really is a curse i'll leave it at that yeah well it and, and isn't that one of the reasons why we love fantasy uh, so much is because we get to explore um, the the better parts of our nature, but also look at the dark parts of our nature and, and see how that can play out. And then invariably, we tend to make the same mistakes in real life that, that we could have easily solved by, by creating stories in, in one of our fantastical worlds. Well, a good book has conflict. Yeah. And to me, uh, a good 
explanation of the conflict is when you get inside the heads of, of the protagonists and the antagonists. And seeing the world from someone else's, someone other than, someone different than you, seeing the world from the viewpoint of someone who has a different viewpoint than you, to me is growth. It's, it's a critical element if you, you know, we have to coexist. And I think fantasy can do that very well. And must, there are other things about fantasy. The thing, the thing I love about the genre, I've been saying it for a whole bunch of years, is that it, there are so many different things you can do with it. That war without guilt, if you're fighting an army of undead or demons, right? You don't have to feel bad about fighting them. Um, so you can have the excitement, the 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 high the high heart rate, the blood pressure pumping, the the tension, without some of the complicating issues of actual war, if you will, the right. the, the horrors of it, on the emotional horrors of it. And I think that's attractive to people. I think another thing about fantasy that's attractive to people is that not everything is explained. There's, there are mysteries. There are, there are things you don't understand. You admit you don't understand them. And that, in a way, is faith. So fantasy, to me, gives you everything, can give you everything you want out of a good good conflict story or adventure story. And that's why I've been with it for 30, well, almost 40 years now I've been writing. Um, and that's why I love the genre so much. Did you ever, you know, when, when most writers break in, you know, there are several years where you just, you're kind of head down doing the work and, and building an audience and building uh, stories that people will care about. Um, at what point did you look back and realize that, uh, well, one, you know, I've made it as a writer. I, I think I'm going to be successful. I can, I can breathe a little now. And then when did you realize that, that you were making such an impact on, on readers and, 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 and this, this kind of shared world that we all get to share in because of D and D and, you know, you're adding to the legend there that, that so many people are playing with and, and the added, uh, you know, benefit of being an author that's telling stories that people are going along with you with At what point did you start to realize, you know, this might be a little bigger than myself? That's a great question. Uh, the, the thing you have to understand is when I started writing, it was longhand in a spiral notebook with a pen. <laughs> Uh, by Candlelight, the Fleetwood Max Tusk album, which was oh, a new yeah. album at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a long time ago. Predates the internet, the popular internet, I should say, and 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 anything but like PC Juniors. PC Juniors weren't even out when I started writing. Wow. So it's a different world now. And, you know, how to break in. I, I wasn't even thinking of when I wrote my first book, I wasn't even thinking of doing this for a living or publishing a book. I just wanted to have something that my kids could give to their grandkids and say, hey, you want to know more about you about your pops. Right. And here's a manuscript you wrote. And so I wrote a book. Um, and I got, you know, I was working a full time job. I was raising a young family with my wife and I were raising a young family together, working hard, trying to get going. But I kept at the writing. I found out that I was getting more out of my writing than just telling a story that it was actually allowing me to crystallize my feelings about the world around me. And so it became kind of my journey. And then when I had that first book ready to go and, and I actually got an offer to audition to do the second Forgotten Realms book. And then I won the audition. Um, I thought it'd be, this would be really great. I'm actually going to walk into a bookstore and see my name on the book. And how cool is that? And that's all I thought it was. Uh, I was still working full time in finance uh, as a as a financial specialist for a high tech company. And, 
you know, then I, I wrote the book and it did really well and I was happy about it. And then I wrote, they asked me to do another one. And I wrote the book and it did even better and I was really happy about it. But I still wasn't making any kind of money or anything on it. Um, then they asked me, you know, write the third one. And I wrote the third one and that hit the New York Times. And I was like, whoa, this is really cool. And the numbers got better. The, the checks got bigger and they wanted more books from me. And they asked me to quit my job. And I was terrified. And then I did really well. And the book started coming out in hardcover with the legacy. And they were all hitting the times list and doing really well. And I was making a lot of money. And then I thought my career was over because I had a big break with TSR around 1994, 95. And um, and then I got got another chance with Del Rey to do my Demon Wars books. And I went and did that. And then Wizards of the Coast bought TSR. And they asked me back. And I got to that. And but it's always a life where you're wondering, is this going to continue? And it has, it's been that way for a long time. Um, it's not that way anymore because I'm older now and my kids are grown and they're, they're doing their own thing. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been careful with the, the success I've had and the money I've made. And I'm able to, to walk away from it if I want to walk away from it and have been for a while. And that's a better feeling because now I can just write what I want when I want. As for the other part, the influence on people, I'm still shocked. And, you know, every day, I every literally every day, if I open up my email, my PMs, my whatever other social media communication I have with people, I'm being told by someone how big an effect my work had on his or her life. And to be able to affect people in that way at first was really shocking to me and a little bit disconcerting. <laughs> it's humbling and inspiring all at once. That's what I tell them because it is. Um, I'm still not I'm not surprised by it anymore, but I'm still like humbled by it. When I hear from people who are you know in theater overseas uh, in, in Afghanistan or, or Iraq or wh- wherever, telling me that, you know, my books helped them get through the day. Or I hear from somebody who I didn't have any friends in high school and the characters in these books became my friends. That is that is a wonderful feeling and it's a lot of pressure. And by the way, this is something that almost all authors get. I'm not unique in this. This is this is the life we live. And you you hear from the people who whose lives you've touched and it, it can be a little overwhelming. And especially when you've been doing it for this long. Where, you know, I've got readers who have been with me for 30 plus years. So, you know, I've gone through through correspondences and or, or from their friends telling me I've gone through the changes in their lives, too. Uh, and it, it, it's a strange kind of, I guess the word is what, para, parasocial, para friendship or whatever they're calling it now. And But it it's important. It's it's humbling. It's inspiring. It's terrifying <laughs> all at once. <laughs> And, you know, when did I, I think this has become what I've created in the realms. I didn't create the realms. Ed Greenwood did. Let's keep that in front of everybody's mind. And then it was built on sure. by incredibly talented people like Jeff Grubb, Ch- Jim Lowther, Troy Denning, Mary Kirchhoff, all the other writers that I've shared in the realms with Eric Severson, Phil Athens. So, you know, it, the, the realms isn't mine, but I've created within that framework a few things that have kind of jumped the the genre and and it, it have become kind of bigger than the books, bigger than me. And I think that's pretty cool. I don't know how it happened. I'm glad it did. <laughs> and we're all glad it did. Um, You told me that uh, that you're still an, an active gamer. Um has has this past year um changed you gathering with your uh local game group and and being able to uh, you know kind of tell stories with each other well i'm by coastal now i live i live in on the on the west coast in the winters so we usually do it Smart by man. skype uh i mean um discord and roll 20 and D beyond and i i can't I can't say enough good stuff about D&D Beyond and Roll20 and the tools that they've brought to bring gamers together for their their weekly games. But we're back in we're back in the uh in my office now because I'm I'm back on the East Coast and the game groups here every Sunday and 
We're having a good time. And we finally have someone who's been playing with us since he was 15, my brother's kid, who said, all right, I'll DM. He finally said that this, he's in his 40s now. <laughs> so he's been playing with us for like 30 years. And now he's going to DM. And he, he's doing a really good job. And we're all thrilled because all of us are like, I don't want to DM anymore. <laughs> <laughs> If someone has never played D and D, people have, um, you know, misconceptions about what they think it is. In in actuality, it's a it's a group of friends that get together and they are telling a story together. Um, you know, the 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 DM comes up with a scenario, puts you in it, and then you know we kind of see what the dice say and and then you know see how the players react to it, and it's it's collective storytelling. Um, how, as I mean, there's, there's kind of an obvious answer here, but, um, how has that fed your creative life as a writer to have this other outlet where you're telling stories with other people? Um, has that fed you through the years? Well, I think it's, it's very different, became very different very quickly when I began writing full time, because at first I, I started playing D and D before I started writing my first book, uh, a couple of years before, and it was a creative outlet I needed because I didn't have one. I, I was focusing on technical writing. I was doing a lot of math um, courses, and I was working at jobs that weren't very creative, to be honest. So uh, Dungeons and Dragons got me through creatively and fulfilled a need I didn't know I had until I started playing that game. And then, but as I became a writer, I, I was very conscious to keep the two apart. There were some things that show up in my books that happened in the game. Um, some lines, some some funny situations, typically. Very minor, here and there. Maybe a name I stole from a friend for a character or whatever. Um, but I really keep them separate. Um, to me, they're two completely different feelings like when i'm playing a D D game i don't worry about making sure the story makes sense we're just going where we're going and it is what it is whether i'm the dm and letting the players lead me there or one of, or whether i'm one of the players going on with the rest of the group um so i i don't think that the game has influenced the books as much as most people would assume uh what, what the game did, what the Forgotten Realms did, is they gave me a world with set boundaries and magic systems and expectations to find my place in. And that would be similar to if I were going to go write a book about the Civil War, right? I'd read books on the Civil War, I'd learn about the Civil War, and I'd find places to set it, or World War II, or anything else in our world. Um, with the Realms books, I try to be creative within that. Uh, an example would be creating Menzo Berenzan, creating the societies of Ten Towns, creating the Spirit Soaring and the Cleric Quintet. And now I get to create a new culture, a new place in the new book, and it's fantastic. It, this is what I love probably more than anything, is to, is to be able to, to, to build a culture, build a society that makes sense. Um, you know, I... I think until this point, well, still, but Homeland's one of my favorite books in the in the, the Legend of Dreads because I got to create the the society, and I've now got I now I've now I've been able to do that again, and in another place, and it's a very it's an alien society, but it's not it's it's and by alien I mean foreign to our sensibilities, um, and it's. Uh, it, there should be there should be rings of familiarity within it, but something new and exciting and a good place to run a campaign. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, 
or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Looking for a tool to help you visualize your story before the drafting begins? Plot Pins is cloud-based and optimized for any device. There's nothing to download. From the new writer who isn't sure how to tell their story to the veteran who can increase their productivity dramatically, we've had experienced writers lay out a detailed structure for several novels in a series in a matter of a few days. The app takes you through four steps of the process. The concept or logline. Make sure you have a solid concept that you can keep coming back to throughout the process. The outline, 12 beats and 3 acts, each has a description of what should be happening with examples. The board, 40 cards. We take the 12 beats and add sub-beats to those, breaking it down even further and being very specific about what should go into each. These also have examples and descriptions. Right. We take those 40 cards and turn them into a to-do list. For a 50,000-word book, it's about two cards per chapter, roughly. We have a beautiful editor built into the app. You can export your manuscript to a PDF anytime with the click of a button. Let Plot Pins help you visualize your writing project. Use code HANK10 to get 10% off Plot Pins. PlotPins.com Bob, you mentioned um, magic systems a minute ago, and, and a thought just came into my mind when you were talking. Um, you know, what people that maybe are not fans of fantasy might think, um, well, it's all just, you know, magic and swords and, and, and all of this. But one of the things that, that I love about a great fantasy story, and you do this really well, is knowing when – to use magic and when to let your characters figure it out um otherwise um you know where where magic could just you know sum up a novel by chapter three um you choose sometimes to take a different route um when when you have characters that have all of these abilities and you can um solve problems more easily but choose not to how do you start thinking through you know, being careful that characters aren't too powerful and that they have real challenges that uh, that they need to work out the same way we would work out. Well, I place again, this is one of the things that as an author, you're challenged with when you're working in a world with somebody else's magic system, because the game and the books are different. The magic system works differently in the game and my books because I want to limit it. You don't want that a deus ex machina, right? You don't want right. – you have to be careful of that. And so I put logical restrictions and limitations on what the characters in my books can do for that reason because otherwise you don't have a story. There's no tension. There's no anything. Um the other thing is I always try to explore the effects of magic on society around around it. Um, in the world where I made my own magic system, for example, using gemstones, it became the issue of, well, how do they get the gemstones? Who has the gemstones? Oh, did it become a religion 
And so the the priests and the monks of this re- priestesses and the monks of this religion have all the power and have the gemstones. You know, how does this affect the people around them? What conflicts will we see in that? It's really the same. Magic just replaces technology in fantasy books, if you think about it that way, right? Um, you, know, you have a fly spell. You you have an ultralight airplane. You have you have a balloon. You have so. Having the, knowing those limitations and placing those boundaries, I think, on any system you're creating or using is critical. And to put them up front and keep them there is very critical. Uh, and other than that, you're telling a story with people who have tools to get through a conflict, just like you would if you're telling a story about the Civil War or World War II or, you know, some exploration somewhere. What tools did they have? Magic is just another one of those tools. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about like the gods of the realms and everything, but I I keep them out of my books for a reason, for that same reason. Because good novels are about free will and they're about the choices the characters make with that free will. I've never thought about it like that, that, that a good novel is about free will, but you're absolutely right. And uh, I, I've never thought about that. You you always give me something to ponder. That's my job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, I I don't know if you've noticed, um, and and I I say that um, jokingly, um, but there's been a bit of a conversation that's come up on the internet over the last week or so, and it 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 may not have started here, but this is where I noticed it. Um, there was a, a website, I think it was polygon.com posted yep. an article. D and D's drizzed books were built on racist tropes. R.A. Salvatore wants to change that. And I that's that. obviously I even, cl- I even did a quote on that. I said <laughs> I think it's a solid article, but I really hate the, the headline and the lead. Oh yeah, it's it's obviously a clickbait um title. And you know, I hate that we live in a world where you have to use clickbait titles, but that's the reality. Um, the question I have about that, and and I read through the article, and 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 you're right, it's a solid article. That's it's it's not uh, anyone reading that article shouldn't take that much offense to it, no matter which side you're on. Um, but how is how do I say this? Um, is it a should should we expect our fantasy characters, an obviously made up world? where the rules are different, should we expect those characters to behave in the same way that we do? For instance, um, when you're talking about the the drow, or, or if we're talking about demons or things like that, can, can a race of people just be evil? Um, do we have to humanize them? Do we have to bring our own issues that we're dealing with as a society to our fantasy literature um and uh, and one thing i I will say is that to me the drizz stories have always been about um someone who is uh who goes against their nature as it were and if if you want to look at these as nature versus nurture that that argument they go against their nurture they they they, right they go against they, they choose to do the right thing even when when everyone expects them to do otherwise it's kind of like uh like hellboy is is a good example of that you know born a demon chooses not to live that way and that's a that's a even better story um you know to me um what do you think about that are are we asking for trouble when we want to bring the the things that are going on in society now into our fantasy worlds um I don't know that it's avoidable. And let me explain. This is a really complex issue. Sure. Um, part of it is part of it is simple, but part of it is very complex. I do not believe that the drow were built. Built is a really strong word on racist tropes. Okay, let me get that out there. Yeah. Now, I could be wrong about that, but I wasn't in the room when they were created. And I would never make the presumption to say something like that. I never thought of it 
in the terms that we're thinking of it now until probably about 12 years ago when I went to Dragon Con and there was a group of cosplayers who were playing Drow and they had the most magnificent outfits and it was just fantastic. And I, I, they were wonderful people. Just it was a wonderful experience. But when the picture came up on the internet, somebody said, "Why are you posing a bunch of people in blackface?" And I was like, "That's not blackface. They're elves," because that was what I thought. Okay, right. and 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 I'm not. <clears throat> I never made that connection. Now, I've heard from somebody. I'm not sure of all the lore and the 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 creation lore of the drought. I'm not a, I'm not a scholar on that. I don't want to be, I was handed, uh, when they wanted me to do the origin story of Dritz, they asked me to create the drow in the forgotten realms. There were very, there was very little. They gave me, they wanted me to do it. What I did is I based Menzo Berenzan on the five families of New York. I got out my copy of Mario Puzo's, the God- Godfather, <laughs> Because I wanted a society that someone looking at could quickly label as evil. But the truth is there have to be codes. There have to be laws. There have to be reasons. Otherwise, there'll only be one of them left alive. Right. Okay. Now, the the second part of that is what I needed for the Dritz character in the first books, the character I wanted to write was that he be identified, identifiable from a distance on site and prejudged unfairly before he ever opened up his mouth. So if they had handed me the the gray elves, the purple elves, the blue elves, the bald elves, it, it still would have worked. And I would have been fine with that. Okay, but I say it's complex and here's why it's complex. I've been doing these books for 33 years, for 33 years. Well, not so much anymore because now it's now we're better. We're better about these things. But particularly for the first 10, 15 years, I was writing these books. I would get letters from young, young black men and women saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I finally have someone who looks like me. Wow. And I always took that to mean that. Someone someone who was looking at the world through the eyes of being judged before he or she could ever make a statement. And that was an exploration that I took consciously with Dredd. And the I but now, now that it's been put out there, you know. Like with that picture that I mentioned earlier. The whole, and in fact, someone someone put up one piece of lore that said, well, Corellan cursed them and made them black. Well, okay, that's the trope. If that's the lore, that part of the lore has to be buried in the, in the I, I'm, I'm not even going to say what I want to say, but buried in the shallow grave a shallow grave, because when I visit that grave after drinking a six pack, I want that trope to know how I really feel about it. How's that? <laughs> um, and the idea of equating skin color or anything racial like that with just being inherently evil is awful because it has real world implications. That's what I'm talking about. I never said it was built on racist tropes. But if something is being perceived as a racist as a racist trope, fix it. Just fix it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and now I so I don't comment on it's above my pay grade on the skin color issue with the drought, uh, whether they should change it or not. It's co- it's complicated, like I said. But from the very beginning. The idea that the drow of Menzo Burns Island were uniformly evil, I find laughable because Dritt's father wasn't evil. Virna wasn't evil. The house patron wasn't evil. Jarl Axel isn't evil. These are people 
if you think about Menzo Berenzan, you've got a demon queen, a very real, not ethereal, not ephemeral, not, you know, some kind of uh, inner feeling, but an actual physical demon queen who has trapped these people with her priestesses into a cavern in a place where if you leave that cavern, you're going to die, almost certain. And if you're in there and you question her, you're going to be tortured, retrained, or turned into a drither, which is the worst thing of all. What would a society like that look like after thousands of years of being under the rule of a tyrant? Not like the dictators we have in the world who die and then their kids usually come in and screw everything up for their hold on power and can be eventually overthrown. But someone you can't overthrow, what would that society look like? Well, to me, you have the zealots who follow Loth because it gives them power, the high priestesses. And you have the Zachnophanes who want to get rid of them as much as they can. And you have everything in between. And so when I sat down with Wizards of the Coast a few years ago, and we all decided, you know, we have to clarify this. We have to, what is drow law? What is, what, who are the drow? Because I find the concept of inherently evil boring and not realistic. And I say, well, the two things I can do that I want to do, because I've wanted to tell the story of Jarl Axel and Zachnafane before Dritz was born, is I, I'm going back to Menzo Berenzan, and I'll spotlight more of the Zachnafane type characters and the Jarl Axel type characters. And you'll see that even the priestess Dabne, she's a priestess of Loth, and she hates Loth. And she hates everything about what Loth makes that society do. But she's afraid to tell anyone. And she doesn't know why Loth's still giving her power. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing is, the logical thing is, if Loth has trapped these, these various city, this city or various cities underground, and underground in the Forgotten Realms is the phase res, which is the barrier between the, 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 the abyss and the nine hells. Logically, there are going to be other drow. And this isn't new. Um, I think it was early 90s when Elastray came forth and the, the, the group of drow that follow that, the goddess Elastray. And so... It's rare in the section of the world where I'm writing, however, because all they know are the Menzo Berenzan and Ched Nassad Drow, who are Lothians. So by making it very clear that it's culture ruled by a demon that is doing this, to me should solve the question, are Drow inherently evil? The answer is no. Now, I'll take that one step further. If you go back and you read my books, the early books, some of the worst behaving people in those books weren't drow. The, the tribes of Icewind Dale tried to conquer ten towns, and they were going to kill and burn and pillage and viking the place, okay? That's not exactly a good thing to do. When Brunner fought Wolfgar, that when Wolfgar was but a boy and Brunner knocked him down, Brunner could have killed him. And nobody would have batted an eye on the good guy's side. Wolfgar was like 12 years old or something. He was a, he was a boy. Um, and I've, I've been dealing with this for 33 years. I wrote a story in the mid-90s about Dritz meeting a goblin named Nojaim. And the, he finds out the goblin was an escaped slave. And he meets the goblin. He talks to the goblin. The goblin seems like a good dude. A kind of pathetic situation for this good dude. Why is this good dude a slave? And then the people find the Nojaim and they don't do good things to him for trying to escape. It makes Dritz question. 
Because Dritz is a ranger, and rangers in D&D have the sworn enemies, and it's usually orcs and goblins and giant kin and all of that. And he begins to question himself on that. And that's a theme that I've been doing in these books since the mid-90s. In fact, from the beginning, but particularly since the mid-90s. So a headline like that invites fighting. It shuts down dialogue, and it shuts down people... I didn't even want people to know what Starlight Enclave was until they read the book. But that's nothing I can control. I hope so, that made sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. And and um, maybe a, a takeaway from that would be um, while – well, some of the the reaction about the drow might be a knee jerk reaction. Maybe we as writers could do a better job of setting up circumstances so that knee jerk reactions don't happen like that. And and you know, there's a lot of times where that can't happen. You just don't have control over it. But what you can control, maybe we should. Yeah, but I, but I'll also add that there's there's something. One of the things that I talked earlier about war without guilt, and, and I used to say, kiddingly, you know, what I love about fantasy is you embody evil, and then you take out your big sword and you disembody evil. <laughs> and I, you know, that's that's part of the game. I don't think people, I don't think the association of the races, all the races, to the real world, is, I mean, it's your table, it's your house, it's your table, it's your rules, right? Sure. And I will tell my gamers, like, for example, okay, in this world, orcs don't have societies. They don't breed. They are demonic creations to further the means of demons. I, there are times I'll say that. Other times I won't. Other times I'll play on the areas of gray, right? Uh, that's the fun of it. You can create moral dilemmas or you can just be murder hobos. <laughs> that's you know you're just having a little bit of escapist fun and i don't think everything has to be weighed so heavily all the time no yeah and and that goes back to you know why we read fantasy in the first place some sometimes you really want to peel back the layers of an issue that might be difficult to talk about human to human um and and fantasy allows us to work through some of these problems in a in a safe place if you want to look at it that way um and sometimes you just want to escape and just have a fun right uh, but now i want to have the big caveat and this is why we're having this discussion to begin with and by the way this this whole evolution and addition started years ago this isn't anything new sure we had that meeting five years ago at wizards where I sat down with the wonderful team up there. And and, and I, wa- I want to make this very clear. When the person said to me, why are you sitting with people in blackface? I didn't dismiss it out of hand. I did initially. And then I said, wait a minute. Let me think about this. And look, I did not understand at first, why all of a sudden Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben were considered racist. So I listened. I did not even, I I consider myself a student of American history. I've studied history. It's something I love. I've read the books. I've watched every Ken Burns series a thousand times, pretty much. But I, yeah. I, I love history, the world at war. And the, I, this is something that it's one of my loves. How come I didn't know about Tulsa? How come I didn't know about Juneteenth? How come I didn't know that near where I live, there was once a family that had this beautiful plot of land in Manhattan Beach, which is pricey, taken from them because they were black? How come I didn't know all of these things? How come I didn't know, you know, that George Washington, one of his sets of dentures with a slave, with the teeth from taken from a slave? It doesn't mean I can't understand the context of the time or still think of the good positive things. But how come I didn't know all these things? And how come I'm just learning them now? And shame on me if I'm afraid to learn them. 
And shame on me if, if I'm not going to listen to people whose experience with these things are different than mine, especially if they tell me it's painful. And shame on me if I don't do simple things to correct it. And that's how I live my life. And I think that's a, a, a fair and honest reaction. Um, you know, do, someone says to me, oh, you know, you're woke. I'm not woke. <laughs> I'm waking. And I've been waking my entire life. And everybody should be because that means we're just trying to learn more about the world around us and be better to the people we share this this muddled adventure that we call life beside. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bob, you said earlier that Starlight Enclave uh, and and the the Way of the Drow is something that you have been thinking about for for four years or so. What was what was the initial? I, I love to hear how, uh, especially um, series like this that are in an existing world and and you share with other people. Um, how do you start thinking about what a new story will be? Because you already have a, a cast of characters. You have a magic system in place. You have uh, an established world, for for lack of a better term. How do you start thinking of, you know, what this new scenario is that you're going to drop these characters into? It, it's funny, but because from book to book, it's it's I, I have a general idea of what I'm trying to say in a book but I'm a pantser, not a plotter <laughs> um, with the exception, exception of creating a society, because that's something that takes a lot of work. Sure. Uh, whether it's, you know, my demon wars world or men's of barons on the rice wind Dale or Caladay in the new book. Um, but I think the, the thing for me is as I ponder, I thought the Dritz books were over with hero because that's when wizards stopped doing books. And so I really thought that was the ending. And so I really wanted the ending to be Dritz giving a middle finger to Loth's face. <laughs> and he did. And I would have been happy. I, I would have been not happy. I would have been satisfied. But there, there was still a couple of things I wanted to do. I wanted to tell the story of Jarl Axel and Zach Nefane before Dritz was born. And a lot of people wanted to hear it. Um, I did that in generations. Half the book goes back in time. The other half moves the current story forward. I wanted to, um, and because and yes, because of things that I became more aware of over the last decade, um, because I'm listening, I wanted to reinforce those things that maybe weren't said as clearly as they should have been at the very beginning regarding the nature versus nurture with the drought, that it's nurture, it's loath. They are Lothians. That's why they are cruel. Um, and to me, a, any race of beings should be shown to be individuals first. And I don't even like the term race anymore because it, it's more like culture when we're talking about it than anything else. But individuals have free will and reasoning beings have free will. And free will means that in a in a pristine, wonderful, you know, utopic society, you're going to have some bad people who will take advantage. And in a in a cruel and vicious and warlike society, you're going to have some good people who will try to make sense of it. And maybe even try to correct it or get away from it. And. So the, the evolution of the series, once Wizards let me license Dritz, which was very nice of them, to go to Harper Voyager and, and continue this story, the, the, the two things I really wanted to put forth were, were the, that evolution that I was going through um, and, and just showing more clearly the effect Loth was having on the drow as opposed to just showing the loath zealots in the early books, um, you know, as, as, and then the few exceptions. And then secondly, the idea of creating, you know, 
more evidence to that fact in in creating a new culture or a new society, um, which is what drew me to the realms in the first place. Because if you look at the first gray, the gray box set of the realms, there's an awful lot of empty land. Yeah. And that's what drew a lot of us to the realms was that we could fill in the dots. And then when it got filled in too much, they wanted, they jumped the world a hundred years ahead against my advice. I have to say, um, to kind of, um, reset the place. Um, so the idea of going to a new land and finding something new was, is always appealing to me. And I thought it was, it was, it was a nice capstone to this segment of my writing experience with, with Dritz. So you go into this, uh, new series wanting to correct what, what are perceived as some past wrongs. Um, wanting to better explain what uh, some history and some lore. Um, how do you go from having kind of these big ideas down to, okay, how do I take these big ideas and make a story that people really want to dig into and that keep them turning pages? By finding characters who are the vehicle for those ideas and showing anecdotes with those characters that reinforce those ideas. And I like you say correct, because I don't think correct is the right word. I think reiterate more strongly is the yeah, right word, yeah. um, is the right phrase. Um, one thing I did, I'm really happy with this, by the way. Um, when... Uh, Quenthal was becoming the matron mother of Menzo Berenzan. Nobody thought she could do it because she was kind of a pathetic band race sister. And so they were worried about, oh, this could be a problem. You know, the people, particularly the people of House Bayanre, who did not want to be unseated as the first house. And so they got an illithid who had been in the books from the beginning, kind of this crazy illithid to take the memories from the brain, from the physical synapses in the brain, the, the, the genes, the DNA, the brain of matron Mother Bayenre, who had been killed by Brunner, to take her memories and give them to Quenthal in such an intimate way that they became Quenthal's memories. So if Bayenre had a lover, a lover, Quenthal had that lover in her mind. And not, not, she wasn't confused about who did what, but she, it was like she was there. She had the feelings, the emotions, the everything of, of matron mother, of her mother. And then I did it again when Loth, the avatar of Loth, showed up at this festival and infused Yvonne L., uh, the daughter, it wasn't named Yvonne L. at the time, in utero, the daughter of Gromf Banre, with those same, had the illithids infused those same memories to Yvonne L. in utero. So this child was born with full consciousness in the memories of matron mother Banre. And these two characters became central to the story. Even L used magic to age herself so that she would be an adult very quickly. And she's very powerful. And they became central to the story. And in this book, in the third book, this is why it cracks me up when people say there are big changes coming to the drow. You're late because read the third book. In the third book, Quentha leads Menzo Berenzan up to where a zealot of Loth, one of the matrons, who's, who's absolutely this vicious zealot of Loth, has been given a drider army and a demon army that was put in place on, in that region of the north to basically undo everything that Jarlaxle and Dritz were, and their friends were doing with Luskin and Gontelgrin to basically conquer the region. So Quenthal leads Menzo Baron Zan's army, all of them, up there with it. And in the middle of it all, Camiriel, who's a psionicist drow, who knows the Illithids, helps Quenthal and Ivanel, the younger Ivanel, access the memories of matron mother Ivanel the Eternal Banre, but to do it in a different way. Instead of just the natural flow of memories and how she felt at that time, take how she was at the beginning. And then go through centuries of Loth digging little holes and rabbit holes for her to fall deeper into. 
and and kind of not not take that emotional journey that led to the actions 1500 or 2000 years later but instead who was she then and the shock of who she had become as compared to who she was before loth led her into this rabbit hole appalled those two and began the heresy the great heresy that they created against loth which in the newer books you're seeing there's a big civil war coming in men's or baron's on because of this because of the actions of yvonne l the younger and quenthal and the rejection of loth by the first house of men's or baron's on so basically what i did is i told an alternate creation story of men's or baron's on to the one that they had been taught for all their lives now to make what i really liked about it though is am i right well i don't know because after Camariel does all this and Jarlaxle and Camariel are talking, Jarlaxle looks at Camariel and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. These memories, these ancient memories before any of us were born, when when Ivanel was young, Matron Mother Banray was young, they were given to Quenthal and Ivanel by the Illithids. Yep. And the Illithids helped you see how to have them access those memories in a certain way to come to this conclusion. Yep. The elephants. Oh, yeah. So is it reliable narrator or is it unreliable narrator? But isn't that the truth of history? <laughs> I love it. I love isn't it. that the truth of history? Yes. George Washington had wooden teeth. No, he didn't. That that is that is an amazing way to to couch this story. Um, would you know when you start thinking about, um, you know how to, you know when you've got a, a legend that grows and grows and grows, the, the way, um, that that this whole mythology is there. There's a great storyteller can find new ways to come in and look at a situation and have characters deal with it. Uh, and I, I think it's just an an amazing thing that you've come up with and, and a great way to to uh, to address this. And, and, and I have a prediction that in the not too distant future, I don't know, I don't have any inside information on this. This is just my prediction and it's born out of confidence of being in this business and doing what I'm doing for 34 years now. Um, Wizards of the Coast will do a, a campaign that begins in Caliday, and people will enjoy the hell out of it. And all yeah. of this kerfluffle will be way in the rearview mirror, and we'll be going our merry ways with it. Well, that was going to be my next question. Is I, I know that you're licensing the character from Wizards, and and the the new books are published by Harper. Um, but are you? Are you still having communication with wizards about what you're oh, doing with yes. the character and, and what kind oh, of feedback are you getting from them? Absolutely. I mean, wizards hired me to write Sleep Sound, the video that Benedict Cumberbatch narrated there, the, the animated one that they just did such an amazing job on that oh, video. Yeah. Um, you know, Wizards has right of uh, editorial rights over anything I do. Um, they get the book. Uh, they get the rough draft of the book when my editor at Harper Voyager gets the book. They don't edit it like an editor, but there, if there were things that they wish I would have said, they'll ask me. Now, they're not doing much. They They trust my judgment on a lot of these things. But if they have something, for example, that kind of ties in with what I'm doing, like, for example, um, I had to explain a certain phenomenon. And so I, I called Chris Perkins. I called, I called Chris. I called, I talked to Jeremy. I talked to Jeremy. I talked to Mike. I talked to a whole bunch of different people trying to get some ideas from existing lore that would tie into this thing I had to, to put together to explain um, this kind of weird, not natural, but phenomenon up in the area I was exploring. 
And <clears throat> having that to build on made it much more satisfying and richer than just, you know, making my own explanation up ad hoc and, and uh, you know, or just not explaining it. So having those shoulders of giants to stand on, whether it's Gary Gygax, Dave Arneson, or Ed Greenwood, or Margaret Weiss, or Tracy Hickman, and, or the people that have come since I joined in on this grand adventure that we're all going through, um, makes parts of the book much richer without me having to spend, you know, weeks and months trying to come up with things because they're already there. So, yeah, it's back and forth. Wizards is very aware of everything I'm doing. If they're not, it's because they're not reading what I'm sending them, which are the <laughs> manuscripts and the outlines, which have to be approved by them. The covers are approved by them. They're, they're very involved in this process, and I would have it no other way. Yeah, that's fantastic to hear. Starlight Enclave is book one in this new trilogy, The Way of the Drow. Uh, what can we expect from the next two books in the series? Are, are you... Are you taking, I know that you're taking us somewhere specific. What can we look forward to without spoilers, obviously, but where are you leading us? Without spoilers, two more books. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Uh, no, uh, the, the, this book ends and there's obviously work to be done when this book ends because there's a real problem that has to be solved and it has to be solved quickly. Um, and that's the second book. Uh, and then there's there's still that that overarching issue that's brewing in, in of of a potential civil war in Menzo Baranzan that isn't going away. Um, and in fact, is heating up. So I would say, um, you know, that, that you can you can see I've got a lot to cover in a couple of books. Well, Bob. As always, uh, when when I finish one of your books or I finish a conversation with you, I'm left with more to stew on and and to think about, and and that's what you've done, you know, to me for 30 years, and I I, I appreciate that more than you know. Starlight Enclave is on sale everywhere now. When you're hearing this, there's going to be links to it in the show notes. Um, Bob, what do you think about your books? Uh, and audio. Uh, I, I know that there's an audio book, obviously, with this releasing on the same day as the book, but um, you, I've listened to a number of your back catalog and audio, and I love revisiting some of those stories in that way. What, what do you think about audio books and, and your stories in general? I think it makes them more accessible. I love it. And I love that. I mean, it's Victor Bavine, so yeah. <laughs> I win. Um <laughs> Cause I love Victor and I've been really lucky cause I had um, Tim Gerard Reynolds, Gerard Reynolds doing my demon wars books. And he had, the, we have, we've just picked a couple of, of people for the color of dragons book that I had the YA book I have coming out that I wrote with Erica uh, Lewis that's coming out in October. And I've been really lucky because I've watched this industry, the audio industry grow and the people narrating the books become stars in their own right. And so they're bringing audience to the books that maybe I, I, I'm without doubt people have picked up the Dritz books to hear Victor, not even knowing what they were, were picking up because they're fans of Victor. So those are the kind of things that there's a real there's a real I don't like the word synergy. There's a real partnership between the authors and the the people reading the books and. I've even, I even give them permission to leave out some attribution of dialogue because they're doing that with their accents, right? right. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of its own art form, but it's so true to what I did that it's – I'll take credit for the audio. Um, and I, I, I love it. I mean one of my favorite moments was uh, many years ago. I was sitting there and my wife came walking out of the back room. She said, Bob, did you read this? And she showed me Ice T's blog that she had come across <laughs> where he was talking about going in to record a story. And then he found out it was like, what is this stuff? There's flying horses and talking swords. And he's going on and on and on and on about it. And it was hilarious. And I'm like, son of a gun, that's my story. And I'm like, nobody told me they were doing this. What is this? 
And what it was is they were kind of doing it as a as a promotion and as a gift, you know, kind of a surprise to me. Um, where Audible, and I I, I I assume with Watsy they they got Ice T and Will Wheaton and Felicia Day and David Duchovny and Weird Al Yankovic and Melissa Roche and and on and on this kind of like unexpected eclectic cast to each do the stories the legend of dread short stories that i had done in dragon magazine or in the various anthologies and felicia day's bones and stones still crushes me but anyway it was just it was just what a fun experience and then and then to cap it off i got invited to ice t's house to be on his blog and I love I, I just love this man. I love his work. Uh, and but I couldn't go because I had a TSA appointment that I couldn't break for my known traveler card. So I'm what <laughs> I went to the I went to Logan Airport in Boston and I did my interview and then I come out and I had to call in. And here I am walking through the streets of Boston on my way to Fenway Park with my wife to watch the Red Sox on the phone with Ice T. And the first thing he says to me is. Don't even tell me you can pronounce these names. <laughs> and I said, of course I can't. And he says, oh, I love you. And we went rolling from there. And it's like, it's just so surreal. It's just such fun, you know. Um, but I love the audio books. I've met Victor. Victor, he wrote a book. It's really good, by the way. Um, but, you know, Victor called calls me up when he's reading one of my books. And he called me up. I think it was with Timeless. And he was related. To, he says, where did you get this? Because I kind of went off on this whole transcendence and, and monk philosophy in that series. And he said, where did you get this? What was your experience that gave you this? And he went off on telling me some very personal stories about himself and how this he related to this. And it was it was wonderful. Um, so I made a new friend. You know, I made new friends in the business when 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 Tim Tim Reynolds calls me up and he's, he's asking me what what he wants when he's doing the coven books for Demon Wars. Well, how do you say this word? And I said, wait a minute, you're Irish, right? He said, he said yeah. I said, don't you think you know better than I do? Tell me how to say this word. I got it off a translator on the Internet. <laughs> and we have this wonderful like back and forth about James Joyce. Right. And I, and I love it. So to me. Audio books have just enhanced. It's made it more accessible. People have so such busy lives. So for people who love audio books, if they can on their commute to work or when they're driving their trucks around the country or whatever they're doing, if audio books, when you're doing housework or you're, you're, you're watching your kids or you're, you're, you're raking your yard or whatever you're doing, if, if that book is playing in the background and you're getting that experience, then that's wonderful. And I think a lot of people are because the, the the sheer numbers that those books are pulling in audio are shot is shocking to me. But it just it just widens the experience for everybody. So I love it, and I have Victor, so I win. <laughs> I think, yes, you do, and and we do as listeners. Uh, every every one of your books, uh, it's it it adds a layer um, of adventure to it, and I love it so much. Grab the audiobook of Starlight Enclave, uh, written by Bob Salvatore, narrated by Victor Bavine, and uh, or pick up the uh, the Kindle edition if you you know like to have them on your Kindle, and uh, and whichever one of those you get, also go buy the hardcover because you need something on your shelf to show off to all your friends. Grab those. There's links in the show notes, or go visit your local bookstore. Spend money locally at bookstores. We need to keep them going. Bob, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for taking uh, so much time to come back on the show and to sh just share all things fantasy. Um, we wish you much uh, continued success. Um, tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do. Well, I have um, capital R, period, uh, capital R, capital A, Salvatore on Facebook. That's my professional page. Please use that one. Um, I'm trying to make my personal page trying to trim it down to family and very close friends. Um, and I have R underscore A underscore Salvatore on Twitter. Um, I'm, I'm 
kind of active. I'm not as, I'm not as active on social media as I used to be. I, I try to answer all my PMs. I also have RA Salve Tour at AOL.com, which is my public email. You better to get me on Facebook if you want to answer within a year. Um, but I try to answer all my emails, my PMs, my whatever they call it on whatever social media interactions as much as I can. And then I have RA Salvatore, which isn't really my website. It's a friend's, but I don't even know how active that is anymore. But my wife has rasalvastore.com. I stumbled on that this week, and I thought that name was fantastic. Best dad joke ever. Where yes. you can, um, <laughs> it's funny because when she said, we, I, I, was getting, I was getting like dozens of requests, can I sell, send you my books? to be signed. And I don't want to do that for a whole bunch of reasons. First yeah. of all, I can't be responsible for them. And some of these books you can't get anymore. If you send me your first edition crystal shard and it's lost in the mail, it's Oof. gone. And there's nothing yeah. I can do about that. Um, so my wife decided about seven years ago, I think to do our, to do a bookstore. Also, we were going to do a Kickstarter. So it'd be nice to have the bookstore tied in with it so we could get our orders for the Kickstarter out. And she um, was trying to find a name. And I said, all right, solve a store. And everyone laughed at me and groaned and threw things at me. And then she used it. They don't appreciate me or they don't let me know they appreciate me. All of them. My family's rotten to me. What can I say? But anyway, <laughs> she's been going for years. And what she did is she really wanted to set up a site where you could buy the books and get them signed. You can buy them signed or you can get them personalized. So if, if you want to get a book for a friend that says, happy birthday, Hank, there's a place for you to put in happy birthday, Hank. Or you can just say to Hank, and then I'll put something in the books if you want to personalize. Or you can just get them signed. And we've been doing that for a few years now, and 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 it's been it's been going great. And Joe over at rasalvatore.com, he made that site back in the 90s. He, he, he sent me a letter when he was in high school, before the internet. And I answered his letter. And he was so, you know, happy that I had replied to his letter when the internet first started becoming big and people were stealing URLs, you know, they were buying URLs and then trying to sell them to the people for this massive profit. I got this email and here I am fresh to AOL and I get this email that says, uh, dear RA Salvatore, I own RA Salvatore.com. And I went, Oh, here we go. How much does he want? And, and then it goes on and he says, I only bought this URL so that no one could blackmail you for it. And I'll give it to you. But all I ask is that you come look at the website. I set up for you. And I looked at the website and I said, just keep it. And then when when my brother was ill, I'm going I'm going long here. Is that OK? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. OK. When my brother was ill and he couldn't work anymore, I started a company called Seven Swords. And I only did it so that he would have a reason to come over and work and, and create and have fun. And it was our gaming group. And I was trying to think of ways we could make the gaming group profitable because there were six other people putting money into it. And I came up with the concept of let's do e-signings. What's an e-signing? Well, someone can write to us on the internet and order a book and I'll, I'll sign it for them. And so that's where e-signings came from. And I think I actually own the copyright on that. We bought it back with Seven Swords. And the only reason I bought it was that no one could ever stop an author from using it. Um, you have my permission if you ever sell your books to use the word e-signing. Please do. You don't owe me anything, but nobody can make you not use it. That's why I did it. And I, when Seven Swords disbanded, I gave that to Joe at rasalvatore.com, and he still does it. And he's driving up here this weekend with close to a thousand books from his e-signing for Starlight Enclave. Uh, Joe and Duff will come up in the truck full of books and we'll sit down in my office and we'll sign books and throw pizza at each other and catch up because we haven't seen each other since the last book. And again, it's just part of this amazing journey. And the way I look at my writing is that I've been on this wonderful journey of adventure and all these people have stepped on the road beside me and gone down this, this road and we're having a lot of fun. And so there it is, rasalvatore.com, rasalvastore.com if you want any of the backlist books, and you can get me on Twitter and Facebook on my accounts. How's that? And that's perfect. And I wasn't will... long-winded, I'd write short <laughs> stories, damn it. <laughs> we are so happy that you are long-winded, uh, trust me. <laughs> um, I have a bookshelf to prove it. Uh, 
I'll link up all of those places in the show notes as well. Bob, it's always fun every year when we get to catch up. Uh, we're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of Starlight Enclave and clear off a shelf, guys. There's more books coming and in the series. And please support your local bookstores. Yes, absolutely. 100%. Bob, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Thanks for having me on, Hank. It's always fun because you don't just... I mean, you, you, you pull it out of me, you bastard. <laughs> Wargate Books presents Hit and Fade Forgotten Ruin Book Two by Jason Onspach and Nick Cole. Narrated for you by Christopher Ryan Grant. Chapter 1. The Army of the Dead walked straight into our ambush east of Fortress Hawthorne. That's what the fob is called now, Fortress Hawthorne. Despite it being officially known as Forward Operating Base Hawthorne, as was originally intended when the 50 detachments of various special operations groups came forward through time from Area 51, a one-way mission to save Western civilization from a rampaging nano-plague destroying the very fabric of said civilization. Apparently, we overshot the temporal insertion point and stuck the landing. Sorta. About 10,000 years too late. Said civilization is now basically something straight out of Tolkien, or Dungeons and Dragons which we've all now gotten a lot more familiar with thanks to our resident expert and fledgling hedge wizard, the infamous P.F.C. Kennedy. But the Rangers just call it the FOB. The first of our explosives to ruin the leading elements of the Army of the Dead advancing on us, Claymore Mines, the recaptured forge back at Hawthorne, had cranked out in the weeks after we'd retaken it from King Triton, were fired by Ranger Sergeant Kang down there with the scouts and Captain Knifehand's assaulters. It was close to midnight when the front rank of bony warriors, carrying rotting shields and spears, eyes glowing malevolently in the deep night mist, advanced into our ambush, only to get ruined by the daisy-chained Claymore's sudden eruption. Above us, a cloud-shrouded moon cast a wan yellow light over the battlefield. The night was hot, and spring was coming on full now. The pilots who'd gotten us here in the grounded C-17 back at Ranger Alamo, using their meteorology skills, had guessed it was going to be a long, hot summer ahead of us, and an early one at that but there was a cold shiver in the dark on your exposed skin that you couldn't quite explain when you saw the dead advancing rank after rank. The bone warriors carrying spear and shield, other darker creatures barely seen. The lower areas of the earth were graveyard cool and misty, so maybe that was it. Still, the brutal, unrelenting cold of our almost last stand back at Ranger Alamo was gone now. But not the horrors. There wasn't a night that some ranger didn't wake up out of a tormented sleep, breathing heavy, sidearms scanning the dark and looking for orcs and ogres to ventilate. I was sweating in the hour leading up to the attack, despite the night and the mist. Kurtz had us humping hard to get the 240 and all its ammo up to the top of a small hill that overlooked the area where we'd channel the advancing echelons of the Army of the Dead into further fun and games the rangers had planned at a bend in a riverbed. If the approaching Army of the Dead continued on their current course track, they'd enter it for a brief period. It was decided by the captain we'd kill them there and I was sweating. Not because of fear. No, not at all. Firing, whispered Sergeant Kang over the calm as he detonated the mines, and eight daisy-chained claymores spat thousands of steel balls all across the front line of what even I was still finding it hard to believe I was seeing through my night vision device. 
Skeletons. Warrior skeletons. Ancient warriors like something out of the bronze or iron ages. Worked breastplates of molded plate or rotting scales. Green and tarnished, stamped with the markings of fabled armies fallen in battles long, long ago. Leather cuirasses on some. Rotting boots. Helms with broken horns, missing teeth, tattered leather kilts. Beads and charms dangling from bone wrists. Enigmatic holy signs and primal torques black with grave dirt or from a funeral pyre long ago on some forgotten battlefield far from here, draped about the spine where the throat should be. Where it rises to connect to a bone-white skull that seems filled with malevolent purpose and diabolical intelligence. Malignantly so. Walking skeletons like something out of a Ray Harryhausen clay model Sinbad epic from the 1960s. Above, the sliver of moon gave enough light to strengthen our NVGs, making the night vision devices perform exceptionally well as we sprang our trap and watched the advancing elements get rocked by our initial high-explosive opening bid in the game we were about to play. The air was still and hot in the moments before the fight began as we lay there in the tall, sharp grass, waiting for it all to go down. I was thinking a hot cup of coffee would be nice about now, except my canteen only had cold coffee I'd brewed during the long, silent, and windy afternoon of preparation. Still, I was happy knowing I had some, rather than none. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.